Yeah, I love that Keith Green song. Um, I remember uh, when I was in, in college, first hearing that song, and there's just so much uh, joy there. You know, joy to the world. You know, he's risen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So uh, I've adopted a tradition from my Methodist background. I love this call and response, right? So at Easter time, I proclaim that Christ is risen, and you answer that he is risen indeed. Okay, so let's practice. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Okay, come on. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Oh, one more time. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Joy to the world. Yeah, Christianity is based on the victory of Jesus at the resurrection. So there's so much God wanted to do, but God was able to pull victory out of what looked like a defeat because of Jesus' absolute faith, love, and commitment. And this is what we're celebrating here uh, at, at Easter time. I like to, to go back and look at, this is from the, the divine principle, our, our kind of our, our core unification is teachings. And the discussion about Jesus and God's whole providence of restoration and the key role that Jesus played in that. So let me read. God had personally been guiding his beloved chosen people until the time Jesus appeared as the Messiah. He's speaking about the Jewish people. Yet, from the moment they turned against his only begotten son, God tearfully had to turn his back and allow Satan to lay claim to them. Continues, Nonetheless, Jesus' purpose in sending the Messiah was to save the Jewish people and all humanity. God was determined to save humankind, even though it meant delivering Jesus into the hands of Satan. Satan, on the other hand, was fixed on killing one man, Jesus Christ, even though he might have to hand back all of humanity, including the Jewish people, to God. In the end, God handed over Jesus to Satan as the condition of indemnity to save all humankind. Jesus was offered as a ransom for many. He went this alternate course due to the faithlessness of the chosen people, the people that God had raised up and prepared and invested in for all of their history. You know, and we have 4,000 biblical years tracing all of God's efforts to prepare people to receive Jesus as the Messiah. And still, they didn't know, as Jesus said, the time of their visitation. And how painful that was for Jesus. How much longing he had to, to, to bring them all together. But in spite of the tragedy of the crucifixion, where Jesus was not able to build the kingdom of heaven in his lifetime. He went the way of the cross and took on the burden, took on the sin. And as a result, we have spiritual salvation. We have the chance to liberation and he prepared the foundation, the way for Christ to come again. So, in spite of the tragedy that we remember on Friday, today, Resurrection Sunday, as we remember the victory and the foundation for all that came afterwards and the, the joy that even we can feel because out of a terrible situation God never gives up and God turns what the devil wants for evil he turns it to good Amen? Amen. <laughs> so Christ is risen! He is risen Very good! Christ is risen! He is risen Christ is risen! Right? Okay, let's read the, the New Testament account. This is from the book of Luke and the, the verses uh, about Jesus' resurrection. So this is from the 24th chapter of Luke. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. 
In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Christ is risen. Indeed. <laughs> Jesus Christ is no longer dead. Joy to the world. Right? Alleluia. So, this is uh, what Father Moon uh, said uh, about uh, Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' resurrection was the first representation of the glory of heaven and the glory of victory won in the fight with Satan in the 4,000 year history. Through the crucifixion, Jesus took on the responsibility for the 4,000 year history of the dispensation and the responsibility of the ancestors. Representing the glory of heaven, he ascended to heaven. Again, in spite of the tragedy, in spite of the rejection by the chosen people who God had raised up and invested so much to prepare to receive the Messiah, to be the head and never the tail, to lead the world to build in the heavenly kingdom. The victory came with the resurrection. And it could happen because of who Jesus Christ is. So God opened the way for all of us, for all of humanity, to be engrafted with the resurrected Jesus and thereby receive salvation and be born again. So, let's, let's look a little bit more. You know, in this Easter time, it's good to think about resurrection. Because there's resurrection, of course, Jesus' is resurrection, but also there's other meanings that we look at when we think about resurrection. From the divine principle, we emphasize resurrection means moving from spiritual death to life. We're not talking about zombies coming back to life from the dead. We're talking about moving from spiritually being dead to becoming spiritually alive. Now, in God's providence, it's been about the resurrection of all of humanity. And when we study uh, the history of, of God's work and God's providence, and I encourage you, come join us on Saturday mornings. It's, we have, it's an exciting and fun time where we explore and, and, uh, the, the divine principle. And lately we've been looking particularly at history in God's providence to resurrect all people, all of humankind. But resurrection, you know, we're celebrating the, the breakthrough that God had because of Jesus. You know, the foundation that Jesus made. But also, there's the individual resurrection that's ongoing in our daily life. Every day, we need to be resurrected. You know, when we wake up in the morning, hallelujah, I've been resurrected. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't stay in bed, right? I got out of bed. I woke up. I came to life. So daily, we have to resurrect ourselves also from our bad habits. You know, we, when we, we had this ceremony and uh, true parents are constantly encouraging us and giving us grace and conditions but it's our responsibility to continue to grow ourselves the continual process of, of removing our fallen nature removing the dead parts of us you know, you know our, our fallen attitudes or, you know, and raise up our spirit raise up our ability to love be truly in the dominion of God's love, God's genuine love. And the move, you know, what God is looking for is for us to be able to dwell completely in the presence of his love. So even, this is from um, St. Paul, the, the book of Philippians, this is the third chapter. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. So resurrection for us means moving from the fallen realm and coming back to life. So could have to come bring it back home, right? It always comes back to us. What's our daily resurrection look like? You know, what do we do on a daily basis 
to grow ourselves, to resurrect ourselves. We've got an incredible foundation that we inherit through Jesus and all of the history of Christianity. So much sacrifice. And even the foundation that we have because of Father Mother Moon, who Jesus called to his mission, to fulfill the, the mission of the second coming, to resurrect us, not just spiritually, but completely, and to build God's heavenly kingdom on earth. So daily, we know the traditions. We're, we're, we're constantly working to develop habits in our life so that we're daily growing and resurrecting ourselves. So the first thing is, our communion with God every day. Please make a habit of spending quality time with God. Now, prayer time, meditation time, reflection time, conversations with God. Not just, you know, sometimes, you know, I've got, sometimes I'm just praying, you know, got a list of things to pray for and just praying for these conditions. But no, really prayer where we're fellowshipping with God where we're dwelling in the presence of God, feeling God's love and embrace. Sometimes it means just sitting and being quiet. For me, my favorite meditation is, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And just, just letting that flow through me. Just feeling that. God, how much God loves us and cares for us. That kind of communion can be so healing to our spirit, so healing to our heart and to our soul. We need that communion more than we need oxygen, more than we need food or anything else. We need that, that communion, that experience of God's love. Because without that feeling of, of God's love, knowing that we're loved, our lives are miserable. They're empty. And when we feel empty, we feel afraid. And when we're afraid, we're destructive to the world around us. We do things to protect ourselves. We hurt other people. You know, we're not loving. It's hard to be giving. So daily we resurrect ourselves by filling ourselves up with the presence of God. Daily. Daily. Make a habit. I encourage you. Every day. You know, it's nice to give yourself quiet time. Okay, commit to have some quality time with God. And then, also, daily, let's we grow ourselves by studying God's Word. By filling our mind with the truth. The more we can see from God's perspective, the more we can see how God has been working and understand God's heart, God's desire, and God's longing for the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is why when we teach divine principle, we start off with God's ideal. Because when we understand God's vision, God's desire for us, we know where we want to go. And then when we understand and study the fall, we understand the pain of God. You know, when Adam and Eve fell away. When Adam and Eve were dominated by selfish desires. When love became perverted. How great, how painful is that for God? And how important for us to purify that love. To resurrect our love so it becomes true, unconditional love. That God can dwell in completely and be with us. By studying God's word, we can understand how God has been working throughout history to bring us back to God. To bring healing to the world. And we understand the process of restoration, the process of salvation, and even the work that we do. And understanding that the, the challenges that we face and the difficulties that come in front of us, don't, not to complain and try to resist them, but no, here's an opportunity for me to grow. Here's an opportunity for me to do something to make a difference. This is an opportunity for me to restore something or heal something. There's no telling what kind of history we're restoring when we face challenges and difficulties in our life. And we restore them by being grateful and loving even in the circumstance that according to the world standards we have every excuse to say, not my fault, accusing other people and blaming. But when we don't go that way, this is why studying God's word, understanding how God works to bring healing, not only in our own lives, but in our lineage, 
in the world around us, in all of God's providence. It's so important for us to study God's word. So I encourage you every day. Make, this is why we have this tradition of Hundake. Daily studying God's word. Studying and meditating and chewing on the words and applying them to our daily life. I'm so grateful for Dr. Young in the daily study where he continues to go through and every, every morning he's really pushing, I know pushing me anyway, to grow myself, to resurrect myself. So then the third point, you know, is daily, is working on our own self-control. Unity between our mind and body. A lot of times, you know, my mind, oh yeah, I want to do all these great things and I have these great ideas and I make these big promises and have these big visions of things I want to do. But then I get up, wake up in the morning and say, oh, yeah, I don't feel like it. <laughs> the body just kind of goes, why are you kidding me? You're going to get up and you can be so uncomfortable and it's going to be difficult. No, self-discipline and self-control means I'm able to go places where I'm uncomfortable. Go to places where it's difficult. And the thing is, as we build up our, our muscle here, our ability to go through circumstances that are uncomfortable, that are difficult, we strengthen our ability to do them more easily. It's less of a challenge. If we've, in the small things, we've we, we made these little sacrifices so that it's easier when we need to make a bigger sacrifice. So daily sacrificing, looking, okay, self-discipline in, in, in the day, okay, where's something where I can exert some self-control? Okay, so I'm, I'm eating breakfast and I really, oh, that was really good, I think I'll have some more. Oh, I have a choice now. Do I really need more? I can make a choice, okay, I, it wouldn't hurt to eat more, but by practicing, okay, I'm going to deny my desire, you know, just a little bit. It's not a big deal. You know, I'm not fasting or anything. I'm just practicing making choices to sacrifice and, and holding myself back a little bit. And there's, you know, this, oh, we have opportunities to do this all the time in our daily life, in our daily experiences. And the more we practice that experience of some controlling myself, limiting, limiting myself, even when I don't need to. Now that's, that's when you really can tell. You know, I don't need to, but I'm going to. That's where we strengthen our self-discipline and our self-control muscles. Then the, the fourth thing that if we really want to resurrect ourselves, we need to be making a difference in the world. This is where we find real joy and fulfillment in our lives. is by making a positive impact, a contribution to the world around us through serving others. Father Moon often used the term living for the sake of others. But this is where we get joy, energy, vitality in our lives. is when we do things that make a difference for the people around us. And especially just all the time, there's opportunities for us to, to just make the world a better place. Just, you know, going out in the parking lot, oh, there's some trash. Oh, somebody ought to pick that up. Oh, maybe me. <laughs> maybe I should pick that up. I mean, hey, I picked up that little piece of trash. You know what? I made the world a better place. You know? <laughs> yeah, every little thing. <laughs> And there's so many opportunities we have all the time. You know, even just, you know, serve, helping someone out. You know, see someone that maybe needs a little help. Okay, I go a little bit out of my way and make that person's life a little bit better. Just, you know, by helping them maybe carry something, giving them directions to go somewhere. There's all kinds of ways all the time. God is so thrilled when God sees us being a blessing to others serving and making a difference, a positive difference in the lives of the people around us and in the world around us. This is, God gets so excited when he sees us living up to the incredible potential that God gave us. Each of us has unique gifts and talents. And he, God is so excited and happy when God sees us using those talents to be a blessing to the world around us. So when we do that, when we do that, make a difference for other people, 
we resurrect ourselves. We continue to grow and fill ourselves with life. And then the, the, the last point I want to make is just, we have so much to give to people and to the world. We have the understanding, especially through the divine principle. We have a vision. We have God's vision for this world, which is filled with hope, which is filled with love, which is filled with goodness. This world is so filled with, with evil and pain and suffering. And yet we can take on, we can even go the path of suffering and difficulty with a heart of victory and love. Because we understand God's vision. We understand that God is always with us. God is always longing to work through us. And even the circumstances that God allows to come across our lives. Even God doesn't want us to suffer. But God trusts us. That even when we have to face difficulties and sufferings. Because we're living in an evil world. We're living in a fallen world. God's so grateful when God can trust us. And that we can be people who share Hope, vision, and love with others. Of course, Father Moon calls us, we're all called to be messiahs. Messiahs to our tribe. Messiahs to the people around us. And we have so much that we have to share. You're sharing the principle, sharing the incredible gift of the blessing of marriage. You know, and just the incredible opportunity to participate in the most amazing time in human history. When Father and Mother Moon, when true parents called by Jesus Christ are here to resurrect each one of us, but to resurrect this world and to build a world of true love and true peace. Now is the time. We're celebrating, you know, Jesus' resurrection. You know, God turning a bad, you know, situation, the failure of the chosen people who God invested so much in. Well, now we are the people that God is investing in. And God is looking so forward. God is, has so much hope that we will be the people that will make that difference in the world. Are you? Okay, let me uh, conclude with this. Uh, this is from um, one of Father Moon's sermons called Let Us Become the Elite Troop of God. Are you? Okay, amen. Let the grace of resurrection, the blissful taste of new life, and the grace of new life be granted to as many people as possible. In this way, let this be the hour when we can return the glory of the resurrection of new life to Heavenly Father. Amen? Okay, please join me in prayer. Father, Mother, God, our loving Heavenly Parent, we are so grateful for your love for your investment in each one of us. And especially at this time when we're remembering your son Jesus Christ and his absolute commitment to fulfilling your will. And in this past week we've remembered how he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and with you know, cheers and, and acclamations. And yet during that week, further and further because the people wouldn't respond. They didn't respond to Jesus' calling. And finally, he offered us the, the Lord's Supper on Thursday. And, and then even that same evening, he was betrayed. And the next day, even his disciples, they all ran away. And Jesus was crucified, alone. And you had no condition except the absolute love, absolute condition and faith of Jesus Christ, your Son. That even though he went to the cross and took on the burden that he had no, Satan had no accusation toward Jesus. But he served as a ransom for us. And through that sacrifice and through the coming resurrection, which we're celebrating today, Heavenly Parent, we want to be actively part of that resurrection. Actively part of the people that attended the resurrected Christ. And even now that we can attend Father Mother Moon as the true parents who come to bring the fulfillment of your province of restoration and healing in this time. Heavenly Parent, thank you so much. 
Today, this Easter Resurrection Sunday, Heavenly Parent, we want to offer ourselves again to you, determined to be people who are resurrected daily, growing closer to you and multiplying your goodness, your healing, your rebirth to the world around us. So, Heavenly Parent, we thank you and offer up ourselves again to you, gratefully as your sons and daughters and as blessed central families. Amen and adieu.